Um, so please welcome Lyanda Haupt. walk in Lincoln Park that I had this afternoon. So some West Seattleites, who's been to Lincoln Park? Beautiful, one of our jewels in Seattle, right? So I went to just sort of clear my head before doing this talk, and it was actually really complicated there. I got to the park, I'm kind of walking in the sun, and all of a sudden this barred owl flew right over my head. And there's this beautiful owl about this big, big like liquid seal eyes, and it joined another barred owl that it was duetting with. So barred owls have sort of moved into Seattle from the east, so it's ecologically a very controversial presence here. So they, once I found the tree that they landed in, were being attacked by ravens, which are bigger than the owls. So ravens are kind of new nesters in Lincoln Park, and the owls have been attempting to nest there too. So they're attacking the owls because owls eat raven young. The ravens were being attacked by Anna's hummingbirds, Mm -hmm. which have moved up northward. When I was young, there were no Anna's hummingbirds. It was just Rufus hummingbirds, migrant from Mexico. But Anna's hummingbirds lived in California, and they've been moving up as people, rich people with gardens in Magnolia had blooming flowers through the winter. Anna's hummingbirds were staying here. Ravens eat Anna's hummingbirds' nestlings. <laughs> so the Anna's hummingbirds, who are no bigger than the owl's toes, <laughs> were attaching, attacking the crows. And I was informed about all of this and the presence of this tree by the, cr the crows who were attacking the ravens. I said the Anna's hummingbirds were attacking the ravens. Yeah, and crows were attacking everyone for all the same reasons, because everyone's eating each other. So our beautiful wild Seattle is a tangled web. And another thread in that web is, this is where I actually meant to start, is this bird right here. So if I didn't tell you what the name of my new book is, how many of you would be able to identify this bird if you saw it in the world? Okay, so this is a European starling. And even though most people, you're not alone, um, most people cannot identify this bird. And yet, it is the most numerous bird in urban places in North America, including Seattle. There are more starlings than any other bird here where we live. So they are among us. Um, however, for birders, conservationists, nature writers like me, they are also the most hated species of bird in the country, or even the city. And that's because they are a non-native invasive species. Um, they were introduced in 1890 in Central Park, New York. 20 of them were brought over from England. They didn't come to Seattle until 1964, before I was born. And um, now there are 200 million of them in North America. And they all grew out of that 20 population, that population of 20 that started in Central Park. And the reason that they're ecologically complicated is that they're very aggressive, they're very bold, they're omnivorous, they'll eat anything, they're not shy, they're happy to be around people, they're happy to nest in our eaves, as many of you might know. Um, but they also are cavity nesters. So they compete for these very few little spaces that are carved out by woodpeckers for nesting spots. And they outcompete more sensitive species, like chickadees or bluebirds or other um, native wildlife. So they're a very controversial species. So it's a very strange subject for me as a nature writer to choose a starling. But what happened is I heard that Mozart had a pet starling. Um, this is Mozart in the 1780s, what is now um, Austria, Vienna, then it was still Germany. And Mozart actually kept a pet starling for three years. And I just fell in love with this dissonance, you know, that here we have this, you know, character who's considered one of the most sublime Western classical composers, who had as a pet and as a muse this most hated of species, and he cherished his starling. And I found out in my research that he was very influenced by the starling and some of the work while he lived with the starling and even after the starling's death. So I just fell down the obsessive rabbit hole of doing research on this. And I put my binoculars around my neck and you know went outside and studied all the wild starlings in our neighborhood, which are, were pretty easy to find. I went to Salzburg and Vienna and explored Mozart's homes where he lived with the starling and the starlings as they lived there. Of course, read all of the scientific literature about the birds. And I realized that even after all of this, there was one thing missing in my understanding of the story of how Mozart would have lived with a starling. And that was, I had to live with a starling myself. 
So let me go ahead and say that it is completely not legal to disturb the nest eggs or nestlings of almost any bird in North America. And starlings are an exception because of their status as invasives. The Fish and Wildlife Departments at all levels actually encourage us to um, get rid of their nests and destroy their eggs and even their young after they're hatched. We can do anything we want to starlings. So I learned that there was a nest at a Seattle park that was going to be destroyed even though the nestlings were hatched. So it's a harrowing adventure of how I came to have a starling and you'll have to read it in the book. But I ended up with this one when it was basically on its way to the garbage bin in the Seattle Parks Department. Um, and I can tell you it is harrowing to raise a baby starling. This is what my life was like. Sure, yeah. She's about seven days old there. Had her for about two days. So every 20 minutes from dawn till dark. So she grew very fat and fluffy. She was kind of sick when I got her. Um, but um, eventually, we could tell that she was a female. We named her Carmen, which is a Latin word for song. She became very much part of our family, is completely, um, I don't know if she thinks we're humans or um, that she is a human or we're, I don't know what she thinks, but she's definitely part of the flock and we are her family. Um, that was her with my daughter. So I, I wrote the book like this, with her on my shoulder or sitting on my hands, which is actually a very difficult way to type, even if um, she doesn't weigh anything. Um, and one of the things that you can't tell from these tranquil seeming pictures is that the background to our lives is not just you know this bird that likes to hang out with us all the time, but there's this vocal story going on constantly. So starlings are capable mimics. They are as good as parrots and better at crows and ravens at imitating sounds. And they can imitate human language, music, and environmental sounds, other birds, um, the creak of the wood floor. I'm sorry to say at our house, one of the first uh, sounds that Carmen learned to mimic was the sound of the uh, wine bottle cork coming on. <laughs> But what took me way too long to understand, really, was that Carmen is not just mimicking in isolation. And this is something that is not in the scientific literature. It was learned from living day to day and all 24 hours a day with a wild bird, that she does not just mimic randomly. She mimics in context. So she knows what's going to happen next in the house and she makes the sound in anticipation. So when I come downstairs in the morning in my pink you know, sock monkey pajamas or whatever, I walk up to her cage and the first thing she says is, hi Carmen, which is the nor thing I would normally say to her. And then our cat comes downstairs and she looks at Delilah and she says, meow. <laughs> and then when I go to make the coffee and she hears the tinkle of the coffee beans, she goes, Rrr, which is the sound of the coffee grinder. So I'm thinking, wow, this just blows my mind because it's not just Carmen, of course, that can do this. It's all of the starlings that are out there are living in this wondrous, wild attunement. So I want to give you just one little example. You're going to hear me open and close the microwave door, and that is going to be Carmen's cue to beep. It's pitch perfect. You know, if from the next room, I can't tell them apart. I think someone's about to make me popcorn, you know, and it's just her. So what this says to me, and this is a murmuration, beautiful word for starling flocks, murmuration for the whisper of wings. This one's actually over an agricultural area in Scotland. But we have them in Seattle in smaller numbers if you go out towards the airport. Um, even in downtown Seattle, we'll have murmurations of a couple hundred. And what the living with a starling, this you know, invasive, despised species, has taught me is, as Emerson said, we lie in the lap of an immense intelligence. And so when we walk out of our homes, our built homes, and we walk into our wider, wild homes among each other and the more than human world, we are in a listening world. It matters. 
how we walk, how we speak, what we say, whether we're joyful or not, um, the world is listening. And I think that that is, um, to me, very significant if we are going to walk with grace into this rapidly changing future that we're creating in Seattle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Thank you.